Cool. So thank you all for coming out. Everybody hear me okay? That sound good? Perfect. All right. So goals today, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the effect of stress, uh, what people really care about, uh, framework, different types of interventions and measures. Does that still sound okay? Or if I move my head, does the mic go out? It's good? Okay. Trying to use more of a research-led focus. Uh, much research as I can. I didn't put like slide upon slide of like 1,800 references, but if people need more references, um, let me know. And if you want a copy of those slides, I'll pass around a little sign-up sheet. Um, if you want to put your name on there, I'll email them out to you. So if you don't want to frantically scribble down like hundreds of notes, I'll send them to you. That does put you on my newsletter list, but if you hate it, you can just opt off then too. That's fine. So I'll try to speak mostly English, um, probably a little bit of geek along the way though. Here's just quick background, the PhD in exercise physiology, looking more at kind of some metabolism type stuff, did a master's in mechanical engineering and a bunch of other stuff. Did some books, been to a bunch of colleges. Easy thing to remember, I like death metal, dark coffee and dark so if you find me in the morning, you can buy me a dark coffee. If you find me in the evening, you can buy me a dark beer. And that's my wife. So stress, which can be in all sorts of different forms, could be like this heavy dumbbell, which is fun. This is a custom cast dumbbell with like a two and three eighths inch handle. I'm trying to work up to one that's like 172 pounds, which is an inch dumbbell, but not there yet. Could be maybe you're attacked by an alligator down in South Padre. Or it could be more lifting you do in your garage. Trying to run different experiments, holding flaming stuff in your hands. Or I like to do a lot of kiteboarding, and that's me actually wearing a lab coat, kiteboarding, because it's fun. Maybe testing random supplements that get sent to you in the mail by people you've never met in real life. That's actually what that was. <laughs> Depot and spent the extra money for the nice little measuring thing there. And it turned out that it was actually a, a ketone product. But at the time when he sent it to me, I had never met the person. I had talked to him over the internet for about four years, and there's no odor to it or anything like that. It's a clear liquid. And right before I took it, I'm like, oh, is this like the most elaborate like catfish scam like known to man that he's like thought about this this long to see if he could poison someone by their own free will but it wasn't it was actually a ketone ester so one of the problems people are training hard a lot of times you can do that for a while and get pretty good results but what happens when your performance drops and luckily so far this isn't a self-portrait of me on my mountain bike so that's good if you look in the literature, you'll see this is usually classically called overreaching. If this continues over a period of time, depends on the time, you could say it's an overtraining syndrome. Or yes. <coughs> Most of the time people feel tired, performance is down, energy levels are low. A lot of times people get sick or sick more than recently. Uh, maybe you can't sleep enough or sleep is disturbed. Later you can pester Dan Party about your sleep issues. He loves that. Um, hard to concentrate. What I found in a lot of people was a lot of people had these similar symptoms that I was working with. So I was trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. They had done one while, and all of a sudden it just felt like their, their body kind of went off the cliff. To look at different sources of stress, could be maybe family, could be their nutrition, could be movement, could be old injuries, traffic, hour commute each way that they hate. Could be the opposite, it could be lack of movement. Maybe they just don't move that much during the day. Maybe something I spent a lot of time on recently is maybe they're breathing. Maybe they're breathing in more of a stressed fashion all the time that's causing them issues. And when I quote, I figured out a way to put a death metal CD in there, so that was one of my favorite ones. Or it could be just work, right? A lot of people don't really enjoy their jobs. Again, I'm not necessarily talking to but the people out there and the people that you probably work with. <coughs> so what do we use as a definition of stress? We're kind of all on the same page. 
What's interesting is that stress can be interpreted as either novel and or unpredictable, and or have the feeling that he or she does not have control. So maybe you could argue it's a little bit sort of unpredictable, or possibly a threat to the ego. So the definition of stress we're using for the purpose of this talk, so novel or unpredictable, uh, feeling that they do not have control, possible threat to their ego. What's interesting is that determinants of stress response are highly specific and therefore potentially predictable and also measurable. A lot of people tend to just think if you ask them about stress, ah, oh, it's just all this weird, random, horrible crap that happens to me, right? They usually tend to want to give up that sort of control, which I think paradoxically probably makes them stressed. Or you could be just running from a bear. That'll be a lot of stress too. So everybody knows the joke when you run from a bear, right? Don't have to be first, just don't be last. You know, good versus bad stress. If we think about like if we throw someone up into the space station here, we're actually removing one of the main stressors in your life. What stress are we mainly removing if we chuck you up in the space station? Gravity, right? And at first thought, you're like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what happens then. What you see is that you lose a whole bunch of stuff if you don't do any countermeasures. Initially, you'll have a rapid amount of fluid that'll shift upwards, what they call bird legs, and then you're gonna get rid of a lot of fluid. Um, you'll see a loss of bone mass, especially in the heel. There's some cosmonauts who are up early on for a long period of time that still don't have the same bone mass before they went up and they've been back for like decades. So just removing that stressor that we don't really think about a lot of times can have actually more of a negative effect. Um, the other one is, people don't think of maybe trees. Does anyone know what happened to the trees when they made the, uh, does anyone remember the old biosphere where they're trying to recreate this like all enclosed environment? Does anyone remember what happened initially when they put trees in there? How did they grow? They didn't go straight, they actually kind of grew out at like almost a flat angle because they forgot to put wind in there. <laughs> so there was nothing for the tree, there was no stressors for the tree to really react to. So if you start removing some stressors, the body is always adapting. So sometimes we think of stress as kind of quote, good or bad, but I'd argue it just depends on the context of what you're looking at, right? So removing gravity, we do all sorts countermeasures now just to account for the fact that there isn't gravity. Where it becomes an issue is if your stress becomes greater than your recovery. A lot of people I think have this idea that, well, if I just move to you know, some island somewhere and sip my ties and I'm gonna be a coconut farmer, ah, all my life issues will get better. Eh, maybe, for a while, but maybe you get kind of bored and after a while, you start looking to add more stress to your life. The real issue is when your stress becomes higher than your ability to recover from that stress. So anyone who does a lot of training will know this, right? So training, you're actually tearing down different muscle fiber, different structures. So if we do a biopsy of you after just some downhill running or something to just really eccentrically stress the crap out of your legs, we stick it under a microscope, we're gonna look at that muscle fiber, and we're like, holy crap, this looks horrible. All these fibers are all skewed everywhere and Z-line streaming and all this stuff. It just looks like a, a mess. So you may erroneously conclude, oh, that exercise stuff, that's horrible, don't do any of that. Look, it destroys your muscle tissue. If we came back, however, like two or three days later after it's been repaired, oh wow, it's actually better than what it was. So it's both stress and the ability to recover from that. So a little bit of a side note of just the framework based on physiology of what we can use this for. And this is what I actually think most clients actually care about, right? Has anyone here had like an effective discussion about stress with clients? It's kind of hit or miss in my experience. They're concerned about it, but Usually they're more concerned about some type of performance or some type of vanity metric. And most of the time, that's what they're coming to you for, right? It's, you know, there may be some people in here where they're coming to you for stress, 
but not usually. It's usually more for that. So I got to thinking, I'm like, so is there some correlation between that and stress based on physiology? And it turns out there is. So it's a long-winded quote, but what it's saying is that there's a large individual variability in RER, just a fancy word that we use to measure what fuel you're using, of 0.72 to 0.93. So saying the relative rate of fat oxidation ranged from 23 to 93%. So if you come into the lab, and I hook you up to this fancy metabolic cart, this equipment, and you may be using fat pretty good as a fuel source. The next person comes in, ah, they may not really be using fat that well at all. So it turns out just at rest, fat should be the primary fuel that your body is using. And if we look at some of the research, we find that it's pretty variable, that that's not always true across the map. You got another study by Held. I did actually quote my own study there, so you can send me hate mail later. No one else quotes my study, so I might as well. <laughs> so while we look at physiology, it's kind of based on the theory of metabolic flexibility. It's the capacity for skeletal muscle to acutely shift its reliance between lipids and glucose during fasting or in response to insulin, such as postprandial conditions, which is a whole bunch of uber geeky words we all strung together in one sentence. In English, what it means is, can the main thing in your body that's using fuel, which is skeletal muscle, we had to pick out just one item, how well does it shift between using lipids or fat and glucose, maybe carbohydrates, and then wonder what conditions? So during fasting, you primarily want to be using mostly fat, right? Not much is coming in, fat's gonna be your main fuel source. And then postprandial, just a fancy word for after you eat. After you eat, you wanna be shifting to primarily using carbohydrates at that point. So we're looking at how well your body can shift back and forth between these two states. So decrease or loss is hypothesized to play a role in different diseases. And again, if you translate that, <coughs> Some people have a very impaired fat oxidation just at rest for various reasons. So insulin is a nice leverage point. We do need it for survival. And I think it's better to think of that as a fuel selector switch, as I stole from Jeff Bullock. If you have high amounts of insulin, it's pushing your body to use carbohydrates. But if insulin levels are high, if you're Hydrates, what are you not using at that time then on a scale? Fat, right? Exactly. Lower ish insulin, pushing the body to use more fat. The nice part about this is that we do have a lot of dietary control over insulin. A lot of other hormones, you don't really have a whole lot of effect on how well we can change them with nutrition. Which we mentioned something like fasting. So, fasting, you're going to have much lower levels of insulin. It's going to push your body to use more fat, right? It's going to increase that fatty acid oxidation. And I'm not talking about calories, but yes, calories do matter. It's not independent of calories themselves. This is based on a theory called the crossover effect. And as we exercise more, so this is just aerobic power. So as we get out here, we switch to using more carbohydrates. At rest, most people should use more fat. And again, we saw the previous work showing that it doesn't really line up to be this nice and pretty all the time. These lines actually have a fair amount of variability in them. So maybe you're just backwards. So some people are burning a whole bunch of carbohydrates during low intensity exercise. Now, it is true that your body can aerobically use carbs and fat. There may be some benefits to that. But if it's low intensity, I would argue that using carbohydrates is a more inefficient form. So fat's a better fuel for lower intensity work. And we'll get into what happens with stress with this. So regardless of your cheat meals or whatever else you're doing. So again, same thing. So we want to be able to transition between fat to carbohydrates and back down. What we find is that how this relates to stress, if your stress is higher, which end of the spectrum 
do you think you're going to end up going towards? The right or the left? The right. Yep, you're going to get pushed to use more carbohydrates. So the analogy that I use is using carbs during low intensity exercise is sort of like burning nitrous to go to Walmart, right? Don't really need to do that. Does anybody recognize what car this is? The Yugo, yeah. Do you see what they put on the back of it? <laughs> Someone stuck a spoiler on the back of a Yugo, right? So, and that's what I think a lot of times we do with metabolism stuff. Ah, we'll just add a few little fancy things here and there, but yeah, you're still dealing with a Yugo, so you should probably trade your car in. So, hopefully we haven't confused everybody yet so far. So I think it's in your best interest to teach your body to burn fat as a fuel. And stress is one of the main monkey wrenches that screws this up, right? So if you become more and more stressed, your body is going to shift away from using fat as a fuel. However, this doesn't mean that you want to lose the ability to still use carbohydrates. It turns out if you're very stressed or doing high intensity exercise, carbohydrates for that are actually the preferred fuel that you want to use. So again, you want to use the right fuel at the right time. Low intensity work or just resting condition, mostly fat. Higher intensity work or higher stress, you want to use carbohydrates. So what do we do about different interventions that we can do about this? I know Dan likes this one, sleep. No, he doesn't, all right? This is a poster on Dan's wall. So a cool study they did in 2011, they took 15 subjects, average body fat was about 21%, so pretty good, I mean on average, generally healthy. They locked them up in a metabolic chamber for two days. And this is a crossover design, so each person served as their own control. So day one, they allowed them to sleep normally, measure their sleep by EEG. Day two, they fragmented their sleep, or they broke up their sleep and they only allowed them to sleep for one hour at a time. Same duration of sleep though. So the only difference was one time was fragmented, the other time was not, same exact duration. And they found that fragmentation of sleep was accomplished with approximately an hour wake up calls that varied in frequency between 500 to 2000 hertz and intensity between 40 to 110 decibels Subject confirmed waking up by turning their alarms off after two minutes, right? So you get an idea of how horrible it is to try to write up scientific papers. Because you got to quantify everything, right? You don't tell just how often you got to put it in hertz, and you got to say how loud the alarm was to wake them up. You got to make sure that they were actually awake, so you got to verify them by, you know, whacking a button and some other stuff. So it makes it a little bit harder, right? So we wonder if we screw up with their sleep, does that mess with their ability to use carbohydrates? And it actually does. So fragmented sleep had a direct impairment of fat oxidation. So your body's ability to use fat was directly impaired just by literally waking you up once every hour. So you burn less fat. So how much less? So fat oxidation was 61 grams per day in the non-fragmented group, and it dropped to 29 in the fragmented group. So again, we're not talking about a massive amount here, but on a relative scale, it dropped by half. And if you extrapolate this to one month, just over a very simplified linear model, which I know is not necessarily true, especially over a long period of time, but it's about two months or two pounds a month of fat gain. And again, these people slept the same amount of time. They just had one group that was fragmented in sleep and the other group was not. So I like sharing that study with clients too, because the biggest complaint with clients is, oh, you're gonna tell me to go to bed earlier, I just don't have time to go to bed earlier. Which again, a whole different discussion. If you can do things to just increase their quality of sleep, you may be able to again, indirectly or directly affect their metabolism. So what are some things to do? Most of these you've seen before. Sleep in a dark cave, nice and cool. Minimize electronics, less blue light before bed, right? So flux program. Uh, I told my wife I call it my Mr. Mole yellow glasses, right? 
So you have these little yellow glasses you can wear at night. Uh, different supplements can help, melatonin being one of them. Uh, one tip with melatonin, if you take too high of a dose of melatonin, if you find yourself waking up in the middle of the night, actually try to reduce your overall amount. So what can happen is you take melatonin, it peaks up, and then it drops relatively fast. Your body sees that decay and thinks, oh, time to get up. So paradoxically, if you find that you're waking up in the middle of the night or earlier than you think from melatonin, try to go less on a dosage instead of higher. Unfortunately, a lot of the ones that are sold are like three milligram. I've had people go down to as low as even like 0.5 milligrams, so. One of the ones that's kind of surprising I've had more recently is less water before bed. So I have a couple of clients who are like, oh, I always have to get up in the middle of the night to go pee. I'm like, well, how much water do you drink before you go to bed? Well, I was told to drink a lot of water. Maybe you should drink less water before you go to bed. Oh, wow. Crazy. Um, use earplugs to keep down the noise. I usually travel with earplugs and a sleep mask, too. The one one I see a lot is caffeine. And I'm not going to tell you that you can never have coffee again, because that would just be very cruel. So I had a quote that I thought was cool, but no one else seems to like. So I stuck it in here anyway. I said, caffeine is a credit card to sleep. And when you do a PhD, you find out how true that actually is. And then how horrible it is to pay that back once you're actually done. And you know you're screwed when you keep a pillow in the back of your little Volkswagen Jetta to go out and take caffeine power naps at 9 in the morning because you're at the lab at 5 in the morning. So caffeine power nap is to take like some caffeine and then go sleep for about 45 minutes. So when you wake up, you've got peak blood levels of caffeine and you had a light, nice little nap. Again, I do that all the time. Um, so there's some stuff on energy drinks too. I won't talk too much about them. I was one of the authors on that. Um, but they are kind of a sneaky source of caffeine because I've asked clients and I'll say, hey, do you drink much coffee or consume caffeine? Oh no, not much at all. And so I look at their dietary intake and I said, oh, well it says you had like three energy drinks. They're like, oh, there's not much caffeine in there. I'm like, really? It's an energy drink. What do you think they put in there? So and you can look at different effects of that too. So I find that many will actually substitute caffeine for sleep and they don't even really realize it until they actually start to slowly remove caffeine and then they're amazed at how much they actually have to sleep. And this seems like incredibly redundant. More tired, you have a loss of awareness of being tired. Um, Dan's done some very interesting talks on this too. So if you pull people when they're really tired, over time, they're just so used to being tired, they can't really accurately tell you how tired they actually are. And caffeine's actually not a requirement, and it's hard to believe for some. Can interfere with sleep. There's slow versus long metabolizers of caffeine. I had one guy once who came to me, he's like, ah, oh, I took this new pre-workout at like three in the afternoon. He's like, I couldn't sleep forever. And I'm like, all right, you know, you're probably, you know, not very good at metabolizing caffeine. It's staying higher in your blood. And just, you know, how much caffeine was in it? It's like, oh, there's no caffeine in it. I'm like, what? I'm like, there has to be caffeine in it. So I said, take a picture, send me a picture of the label. Send me a picture of the label. And they actually put the sort of chemical IUPACish name for caffeine as the list of ingredients, you know, one, three, blah, blah, blah. So it didn't look like there was caffeine in there because they used a different name. So you sometimes have to watch for them being sneaky. Uh, if you're really curious, you can get a genetic test. They'll kind of roughly tell you, are you a fast or slow metabolizer? There's new data showing that this is probably a little bit of an oversimplification. There's multiple ranges within there. Simple tolerance test works well. Um, you can get in to talk about different dopamine effects. And there's some really interesting stuff now on genetic research, looking at dopamine receptors, how well they work, don't work. Uh, if you're someone like me and you tend to find that you're borderline addicted to adrenaline type hobbies and you love coffee, yes, you probably have a broken dopamine receptor, which I'm sure I do. Uh, has been used for performance enhancement, but the doses are pretty high. So if you have athletes that are using it before lifting, you want to check with them to see how much they're actually taking. Um, so three to six mgs per kg, 
and that's probably a pretty good range. So if you're a 220 pound athlete, even on the low end, we take three milligrams. You're looking at about a 300 milligram dose, or like one and a half of a dose capsule. So it's usually pretty high to see an effect. And again, this will vary a lot from one person to the next. I didn't put a slide in here, but there's another study that if you have people using coffee for caffeine, the caffeine amount in coffee will vary dramatically. A uh, cool study they did going to Starbucks three times over the course of three different days, same coffee, same brewing, same time, same everything. The caffeine content varied by well over 30 to almost 50% in some cases. So for people who are like, well, I just have, you know, one cup of coffee a day, the amount of caffeine in that can be pretty variable. So caffeine's an antagonist of denosine receptors, which we won't talk much about. The one thing I've used for people who like caffeine, but maybe are trying to cut back a little bit, I've used green tea with like two tea bags, which has less caffeine, but still has some. So you tell someone, okay, no more coffee. They're probably not gonna follow that. I know I sure as hell wouldn't follow that. But if they need something in the afternoon, you can put the, the two tea bags in there and just brew it for only like about 30 to 60 seconds and then just take them out. So that'll actually get out most of the caffeine at that time. So the caffeine is more water soluble than the other compounds in there. So they can drink that and have their higher amount of caffeine. Or if they're trying to really reduce caffeine, they can just throw that part out and then rebrew it for about five minutes. Again, is it perfect? No, but it will give you a way to kind of adjust how much caffeine you want in it. Um, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on those. Uh, so most of the caffeine will go into solution in about 90 or 60 seconds. So what would you do? Try to limit it mostly to the AM. Even if you're uh, taking a long time to metabolize caffeine, if you have it first thing in the morning, it's probably unlikely to really mess with your sleep. You can check to see if you're a fast or slow metabolizer. Don't necessarily need a genetic test. Most people will be able to tell you if they are or not. Just move their caffeine back up to the morning and see how they feel. You can use a quick brewing method if you're trying to play around with that. Um, I do like some of the mushroom coffees if anyone's played around with this. This is one from Four Sigmatic. The nice part about this one in particular is there's only 40 milligrams of caffeine, just in the particular coffee that they use. They combine it with some other mushroom extracts too. So it's another way, because I found that sometimes decaf coffee tastes like crap. <laughs> that this actually tastes pretty good. There's not too much caffeine. There's a link if you want more information. And we'll have time for questions on this at the end too. So the other one I found is meditation. Uh, how many in here actually do some type of meditation? Raise your hand. A uh, couple, a few, all right, nice. So practice of meditation, reduce physiologic stress response and improve cognitive function. And the effects were pronounced within a practice of meditation for a longer duration, so about one month. I kind of like to highlight this, that it's not like you're gonna meditate and oh wow, I fixed all my stress. Ooh, that was good, right? So for this one, they saw about one month in duration before people started to see an effect. Um, this is another one looking at that too, improves cognition. This one was interesting. This was probably one of the biggest studies I could <laughs> find. And what they did is they reviewed over 17,000 citations, 47 trials, over 3,000 participants. And then mindfulness meditation programs had moderate evidence to improve anxiety. Um, there's all the stats if you're going to get crazy with that. Maybe depression and lower evidence to improve stress or distress and mental health related quality of life. So when you look at the data on meditation, it's hard to really come to, I'd say, a huge consensus. I personally think that it's probably very beneficial but again, you're also trying to look at what type of meditation, how long do you do it, what population are you looking at? There's just so many variables to look at, it gets to become kind of messy. If we go back to physiology and we go, okay, hmm, what would be the basic thing of how some of these may work? And we find that uh, breathing is highly related to heart rate. So if you're all just sitting here and you start breathing real fast, even though you're not exercising, your heart rate will actually go up. And if we start slowing your breathing rate down, your heart rate 
will go down, what's called respiratory sinus arrhythmia, or RSA. So we know that just by playing around with any type of breathing pattern, which is in general one of the basis of meditation, that we can have effects upon heart rate and different tone related to that. So I put these in here mainly just so you have a reference if you wanted to play around with some stuff. The one that I've done that I like a lot is from uh, Wim Hof. People heard of Wim Hof? What I liked about it is for people who try to meditate, like myself, who are way too neurotic about it, it gave me something to think about. I looked at my notes the other day, and I have been trying to meditate off and on since 2011. <laughs> Probably haven't been able to do it successfully until about a year and a half ago. And what I did was I kept trying to shorten and shorten the time frame. And I would get to the point that I'm like, okay, I got five minutes to meditate. And I'd set my watch, and I'd go out under my little favorite tree or whatever I would do. And I'd lay down, and I'm like, okay, I'm meditating. I'm like, oh, there's a squirrel. I hear a squirrel. Maybe he has rape. He's going to attack me. I should probably look to see where the squirrel went. And I'm like, oh, he's over there. No, wait, I'm not supposed to think about it. I'm supposed to relax. I'm not supposed to think about squirrels or anything else. Oh, I was judging myself because now I was thinking about the squirrel and I was pissed that I was not doing my meditation. I'm like, crap, now I got like two minutes left. Oh. So that didn't work so well, as you can imagine. But with the Wim Hof, I found that it gave my brain something to think about and something to always do. So I won't go through these individual just for the sake of time, but they'll be there so that you have them. And so what he's having you do is do... Uh, breathing at a specific rate and specific times. And then at the end, what I found that worked best for me is that I kind of modified it. I found that to the clients, first thing in the morning was usually the easiest. So just making time to do it. There's some people who do it at the end of the day. It works better for them. To do. Um, do it outside if you can. I find that that works a little bit better. The biggest thing, found 20 minutes for 20 to 30 days in order to start. I found by making the time longer, I was actually able to feel like I had accomplished something and I wasn't so worried about the stress. And it took me a while to actually feel a difference doing it. Ah, oh, okay, so at the end of the 20 minutes, I had like 30 seconds where I felt, oh, kind of relaxed. Oh, cool, okay. So that gave me a little bit of a kick in the butt to do it again. You can use something called a brainwaves app, which is bioral beats that has different tones it plays on each side of your ears with headphones. You can do some specific stuff on breathing points. This is a reflexive performance reset. Along the sternum, the ribs, back of the head. So you're just trying to work on some of that fascial area that's connected to breathing. And I sort of modified it. So I do 30 fast inhales through my nose. Uh, basically just better biomechanics for breathing and then just let out the air. After I hit 30, I'll do a very hard exhale. So I got this from James Anderson. Basically just exhale your soul, right? You should be breathing really hard, get as much air out as you can. And then just hold there for 40 to 160 seconds. I just count in my head. And then once you can't hold your breath any longer and then exhale, <clears throat> inhale all the way and hold. That would include one round and then just repeat. The nice part I find is that it gives you something to kind of think about and to do all the time. In the short version, if you're breathing in and out really fast many times, most people will feel a little bit fuzzy and a little bit lightheaded, which is actually, I think, to your benefit. You actually kind of feel something going on instead of, I've tried some Zen meditation, which I like, but it was literally, I went to the retreat and the guy's like, all right, you sit there, you stare, you look down there, go. I'm like, well, whoa, wait, hold on, hold on. Do we do anything else? Whatever you want. Okay. <laughs> um, so just sitting and trying to do nothing, I found, was, was much harder. This gives you something to think about and to do. And after that, I'll go into a period of you know, relaxed breathing, or there's a whole bunch of different methods you can play around with. So most of these slides in here are just for your reference so that you have them. My whole point with this last part over the next three minutes is just that if you're doing some type of intervention to measure changes in stress, you should probably have a way to actually measure it. So what gets measured gets managed. 
And you can do this by doing what's called a variability analysis on your heart, or heart rate, or HRV. You guys in here heard of heart rate variability before? Ah, cool, awesome. And what you find is by doing a variability analysis of a complex system, you can get more information about the underlying part of that system. And I won't go into how we actually measure it. This is one of the old units I had in the lab. That unit there, which is old, was 10 grand. And the newer sensors are like under 100 bucks. So it's gotten to be pretty inexpensive, which is nice. Just need a heart rate strap or even a little finger sensor. Um, that's the system that I use, iFleet system. And what it allows you to do is to look at your sympathetic, which is fight or flight, or your parasympathetic, rest and digest. So by doing HRV, which is done just once in the morning, it'll give you a range, a number of 1 to 100, how parasympathetic to how sympathetic you are. So that's just how you would actually. So the nice part is you're looking at the response of your body. If you start doing meditation or your, some of the other nutrition stuff that we've learned here, or you start cutting back on caffeine, it's kind of human nature to want to feel like super different right away, and you probably won't. If you look at a number, and you see overall, oh, my marker of stress, the thing that I'm actually trying to change, is showing me that each day I'm getting a little bit better. That's kind of cool. I'm more likely to probably keep continuing that behavior as opposed to, I don't know, I don't really feel that much better, and everything tends to slide backwards at that point. So what do you do? So body is not a linear accumulation of stressors. Some of this can be related to your metabolism, right? So if you're more stressed, you're going to start using more carbohydrates you will not be using fat as much of, as fuel. I can't quite show that that goes the other way, but my guess is that it does. If we can do things to increase your body's ability to use fat at rest, I think that'll actually work to help reduce your overall stress. A couple things to do, work on your sleep, quality of your sleep, limiting caffeine, maybe add meditation by practice. I like having something to measure. So using heart rate variability as your measure for stress. And over time, the side benefit that most clients probably care about is you get to use fat as a fuel. So my last slide, so if you've seen me speak before, it's the same slide all the time. I hate the word optimal. I know what it means, but it drives me bonkers because I can't test anything optimal. So to me, it's like unicorns and pots of gold at the end of the rainbow and jackalopes and all that other kind of stuff. Um, however, I can test if something is better, right? Because you always get those clients who are like, whoa, what's the optimal thing for me to reduce my stress? I don't know. They could always say and ask about something else if it's more optimal. But I can tell them that, hey, if you measure your stress, you reduce some of your caffeine, do some better sleep habits, maybe do some type of meditation practice, you'll be moving to getting better. So I always like to look at what is actually better. If you give me two protocols in the lab, A and B, I can tell you which one's probably better. I couldn't tell you which one would be optimal for either one. So if you just keep thinking of what's actually going to be just a little bit better, then you're going to be moving in the right direction. So we'll take questions. There's my email address. There's around here somewhere with my favorite pen, so someone bring it back up to me. Um, there's my email address, newsletter there. And I'll answer any questions you guys have. Got one over there. Don't all run at the same time. <laughs> Enjoyed your talk, Mike. Uh, oh, so thanks, Todd. I, yeah, so... Um, yeah, I think HRV is a great measure. One other one I didn't hear you talk about, and you talked about all the other hormones you talked about were what was mainly insulin. Um, what do you think about cortisol and cortisol pattern as a measure of stress? Do you use that? Um, what's your view there? Yeah, so you can get a saliva test of cortisol, which I've had done in the past, so a four-point test. I don't know, I think it's okay, but the downside is it's kind of spendy, and 
you're only getting a snapshot of that one day. So I think if you're like completely dysregulated, then yeah, your cortisol is gonna be flipped and it's gonna be all wonky. Yeah, I think it's probably useful to know that. But the thing I don't like about it is it's hard to do that measure day in and day out, right? So you're taking that one snapshot and you'll go, oh, you gotta do this nine month protocol or whatever. Yeah, I think if you do that to maybe show the patient that yeah, you are really messed up and you need some help, okay. And then I would still like to have like an HRV measure of each day so that they know, are you going in the right direction? <laughs> that what we have you do actually help. And then also for the reinforcement on more of the, the client or the patient side, where they can see that, oh yeah, this, this month compared to last month, I'm actually doing a little bit better. So as I'm doing better, I'm more likely to keep doing those behaviors and that type of thing. So that's my bias. Good question though. Um, so besides limiting caffeine, what sorts of, what other interventions do you use to repair broken dopamine receptors? Oh, what a, um, I don't know, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I had a, a buddy who did a, this whole magnificent talk on that. And at the end of the talk, I texted him and I was like, hey, your talk was awesome. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure judging by all my behaviors and stuff that my dopamine receptor is broken. And he writes back, of course it is. That's what makes you, you. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you're right. So I, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can look at, but I don't know if there's anything you can change it, nor would you necessarily want to change it. I think just as long as it doesn't become kind of sort of the main overriding thing, right? So there's a lot of positives from that, but I also look at what is the cost associated with that too. As long as your cost is not getting too high, I think you're probably gonna be okay. So the short answer is I don't have a good answer, so. <laughs> is the talk available? Uh, email me and I'll check. I don't, I don't know. But yeah, I can check if he wants it released or not. So yeah, good question. I measure my HRV every day. Nice. And uh, one interesting thing I found was I go to an acupuncturist, mm -hmm. and besides treating my uh, sore muscles, weightlifting, uh, she treats uh, what they call kidney points. In Chinese medicine, kidney is support of energy. Mm -hmm. And by doing that uh, once a week, my HRV is up an average of 10 points. Nice. Do you have any explanation for that? <laughs> oh. Or is it magical thinking? I'm not sure which. Um, the honest answer is for mechanism, I have no idea. Um, I have done some stuff on myself with a uh, dolphin uh, microcurrent uh, point stimulator. It is primarily for scar release. So there are two handheld devices that put across uh, small amounts of electricity. And they actually will go through and use the same acupuncture points at the end. Um, so I've played around on that on myself, doing my own scar release. I had open heart surgery when I was four and a half, so I've got a massive midline scar. Um, I've done some scar stuff on other people and some of the acupuncture points with that. Most of the time, their HRV will go up five to 10 points for like one to three days. As to why that is, I have absolutely no idea. Um, if you ask them, you're moving more chi around, that type of thing. I think you're looking at a scar is a sympathetic stressor somehow to the nervous system. And by getting you know, better communication across that scar, it reduces stress. But there's only, you can email me, there's like one or two pieces of literature now from them that's, that shows a little bit of that stuff. Um, but it was mostly just an intervention and then we measured HRV. There's not much on a mechanistic side on that that I've seen. So if anyone else has any other ideas on that, by, um, by all means, let me know. It's a good question though, but if it's better, it's better. So yeah, go for it. Yeah, Mike, good talk. Uh, quick question. I recently moved from the southeastern United States where it's warm and the, the winters are relatively mild to uh, New York State. And I moved there in, in the middle of January and it's quite a different climate. And you're used to being bit. in the north. I've, I've, if it was a stressor just dealing with always being cold and uh, having limited you know, access to outdoor exercise activities maybe in the same way or as easily, you know. Uh, you have to go through the rigmarole of bundling up and 
dealing with rain and snow. Uh, what do you do? You think about that, or I yeah, just from a uh, uh, standpoint. The, I know you spend time at the beach a lot, but how do you yeah. feel about the, the weather? Or how's that a component? And lack of sunshine. Yeah, I am. Um, so I think a lot about how how your body can respond to two different things, right? So if you think about fat metabolism here, carbohydrate metabolism here, um, cold adaptations, warm adaptations, right? From ice baths on one end to heat shock, protein upregulation in a sauna, right? And my gut feeling is that the, the more you can go from one of those extremes to the other and still be quote unquote healthy and not have a high cost, I think as a human, you're probably going to be better. Now, the hard part is how far on those extremes do you have to go to get a benefit, right? Do I have to you know, hang out and meditate in a sauna for an hour at 200 degrees to get a benefit, or can I do something walking around in the summer where it's hot out? So the answer is I don't know. Uh, there's some interesting literature on humans as like homeotherms and looking at um, like bears that hibernate. So for whatever reason, I've been fascinated by bears that hibernate. I'm not a bear researcher at all. But especially living in Minnesota, I'm just like, well, how cool is that? Just to eat a bunch of stuff in fall, and it's winter, so it's cold, so you just go sleep all winter. And what's fascinating about bears is that when you wake them up, they'll actually regulate their breathing super fast, so they could literally come out after you, even though they were in deep hibernation. Um, and at the end, when they do studies, there's almost no muscle loss at all. It's almost all fat loss. And they're not in their den like doing push-ups like in the, the middle of their hibernation or anything either. So all that to say, I'm not really sure. But I think the more extremes you can get used to from a temperature standpoint, you're probably going to be better off. But I don't really think we have any handle, at least on literature, in terms of what that looks like in practice. Do we have time for another one? Barely. Sure. Barely? Okay, really quick. For you, we do. So, <laughs> so we talk about metabolic flexibility, but one thing I don't hear talked about very much is the flexibility to go between parasympathetic and sympathetic on a snap. Yes. Uh, for instance, uh, going to a locker room, in a football locker room before the game, people would think that that would be a very tense place, and I can tell you it is zen, total zen, but these are the exact people who, when they need to, can immediately turn it on and then go right back to the Zen state. So is this uh, maybe uh, the chemical makeup that allows for that or the genetic makeup that allows for that? I've just never really seen much on it. Yeah, so I agree 100%. So in terms of the analogy I use, it's really a metabolic flexibility, right? So you've got fat use on this end, carbohydrate use on this end. How far can you go to both extremes? And then what I didn't get into here, and I've done other talks, is how fast can you switch back and forth? Right, so if you go to weight training, how fast can you use carbohydrates to the highest degree? And then during your resting time, how fast can you switch back to use fat metabolism? Uh, same thing in elite athletes, right? So how fast can you go from zero to high speed, right? So Usain Bolt could go from no speed at all to super high speed very fast. Um, in terms of state, how can you do that also, right? Exactly what you said, like I love like the old films of like the old, old school Russian weightlifters where they like walk out to the platform and I'm like, oh man, this guy looks like he's gonna fall asleep. He's gonna do horrible. And the second he picks up the bar, it's like, oh, new world record, drops it down, wanders off stage like he's gonna go take a nap again. But super parasympathetic, extremely sympathetic, like only at the time that it mattered, and then extremely parasympathetic again. And so what you'll find uh, just anecdotally in a lot of athletes are very good to, that can do that, Usually those are the ones, like if you talk to coaches, that have like probably the greatest longevity. So a buddy of mine, who I won't name his name, trains a lot of uh, NHL pros, and he can just run down the list and tell me everyone, he's done Omega Wave testing, HRV testing, everything. The guys who are very sympathetic dominant, they may be pretty good players, but he said they always are, have much higher rate of injuries and they don't last that long. Uh, one guy he works with has been in the league for like 12 years now, He's like just a parasympathetic monster. He was on the table when I was at his place, and I'm doing some work on him, and the guy falls asleep. Like his resting heart rate is like 37. But during a game, he's you know, very in tune, very on, and then after, he can then down-regulate right away. So in practice, what's useful out of that, 
For most people I work with, it's they're missing that ability to downregulate almost entirely. And so you have to give that back to them, whether that's breathing, meditation, whatever it is you want to do, or just aerobic training. And then you can kind of teach them how to kind of switch back and forth. And I think that's a skill that can be taught. Again, once you're pretty good at both of those spectrums. Uh, once you can go from being very parasympathetic to sympathetic, how fast can you switch back and forth? So, yeah, good question.